Hey, my name is Zach. I'm the lead pastor here at Restore. And at our church, we talk a lot about wanting to be a part of restoring faith in Jesus and the church. So we want you to know, wherever you find yourself on your spiritual journey, whether you're deconstructing or reconstructing, whether you're disentangling, doubting, rebuilding, no matter where you are, we want you to know that you are not alone. And we want to be a support for you as you journey down this road of faith. So if you have questions or you need support, we would love to chat with you. You can reach out to us through our website at restoreaustin.org. And we hope you enjoy this week's message. I uh, got bullied when I was a kid. Uh, Not nearly as bad as some folks, um, but still it happened quite a bit. And the worst place that I got bullied was at church. And it wasn't necessarily because the bullies were meaner at church, but because the adults rarely intervened the church where I was at. See, when I was little, there were these two kids at my church who were always coming after me, Caleb and John. Those are not their real names. (laughs) Not like that. But they reminded me of the bullies on a Christmas story. Do you remember these two guys right here? There. There they are. Boo. Yeah. Do you remember their names? Yeah, Scott Farkas, that's right. <laughs> Gosh. They were like those two guys in real life. Caleb was big and John was little, but they were both ruthless, right? Constantly making fun of me for, for being chubby. Clothes were too tight. Or picking on me for being terrible at choir. That's true, that really happened, and I am terrible at singing, so I don't feel that bad about that one. But inevitably, I would tell an adult, Right? I would say, hey, these things are going on. And they they would bring the three of us together, me, Caleb, and John, and they would make Caleb and John apologize. And they would give a real sarcastic, sorry, Zach. And then the adult would turn to me and say, okay, now you have to forgive them and y'all go be friends again. And I would always be like, I don't want to be friends with them, right? They aren't actually sorry. They're just going to do it again. They always just do it again. And the adult who was usually a pastor or a Sunday school teacher would say something like, well, God says that we have to forgive and forget. It's just like how God forgives us. We are supposed to forgive. And then it's like it never happened. All right. It completely goes away. But I'll be honest. I didn't know how to pretend like it never happened, especially when it kept happening over and over again. Pretty soon, (laughs) I had to take matters into my own hands, kind of like Ralphie on A Christmas Story, if you remember that. After Caleb made fun of me the next time, I tackled him into a table. Um, that was the first time I was suspended from Sunday school, not the last. That's another story for another day. But you know what? When I was little, I don't know about you guys, but, but I took those adults at their word, right? I thought being a Christian meant forgiving and forgetting. But as I got older, I started to have some doubts about that especially when I saw forgive and forget used to dismiss some really serious stuff like abuse and oppression. In 2019, the Houston Chronicle dropped a bombshell report that hundreds of Southern Baptist pastors had been abusing thousands of church members for decades without consequences. Now, some pastors and denominational leaders rightly called for justice, Immediately, they stood up, they said, this is not okay. Full investigation, we need to figure out what's going on. We need justice here. But not all of them. Others were quick to call for the abused to forgive and forget. One pastor on Twitter claimed that survivors seeking justice was just as sinful as the original abuse that occurred. Because, quote, Christians are supposed to forgive, reconcile, and move on. But is that really true? Is forgive and forget a Christian concept at all? And what does God actually mean when he says that we are supposed to forgive people? We're going to spend the next few minutes trying to answer all those questions and a few more. You see, over the last month, we've been talking about God's core characteristics in this series called The Nature of God, which is based on this self-description from God in the book of Exodus. The Lord, the Lord, the God of compassion and grace, I am slow to anger, filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. So, so far, we've covered those six bolded words, compassion, grace, love, and faithfulness. Next week, we're going to wrap this series up by talking about God's justice. What does that mean? How does it work? 
But today we are focusing on forgiveness. Now, most of us know that forgiveness is not only a core characteristic of God, it's a core part of what it means to be a Christian, right? Both receiving and extending forgiveness. Throughout this series, we've said over and over again that our understanding of who God is and what God is like directly informs our understanding of who we are and what we should be like. Like Kevin said earlier when he was leading worship, right? The things that we know to be true about God affect the things that we know to be true about us. If we believe God to be vicious, vindictive, and violent, then we will be vicious, vindictive, and violent, and we will feel justified in that behavior because we believe that those characteristics come from God. But thankfully, the opposite of true is true, too. If we rightly understand God to be compassionate and gracious, loving, faithful, forgiving, and just, then we will naturally start moving toward those things as well. This is how God designed it to work, right? God is compassionate with us. We are compassionate to others. God is gracious to us. We are gracious to others, and so on and so forth. But... When we talk about God forgiving us and our responsibility to then forgive others, things get a little bit more complicated. In fact, I think this is the most complex of God's attributes that he is forgiving. Not because it's hard to understand how God forgives us, but because it's hard to understand how we are supposed to forgive others. How does that work? Because like I mentioned a moment ago, Christian forgiveness has often been weaponized used to silence people who have been abused or oppressed, used to keep people who have abused power in power. So how do we practice forgiveness in healthy and Christ-like ways? Well, we're going to begin this morning by looking at a beautiful description of God's forgiveness in Psalms, and then we're going to spend the rest of our time in Matthew chapter 18, talking about a parable that Jesus used to explain what Christian forgiveness should look like and how to do it. Sound good? Not if that sounds good. All right. Psalm 103, that's where we're going to start. It says, he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For his unfailing love toward those who worship him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who worship him. Beautiful, right? That's a beautiful text. Forgiveness is one of God's core characteristics, and he longs to lavish it on all people. But what does that actually mean for us? Well, first it means asking to receive that forgiveness, and then it means learning how to forgive ourselves as well. How many of y'all have ever heard of the, the sinner's prayer? Raise your hand up. Sinner's prayer. Most of us. It gets kind of ragged on a lot, right? Because it's very reductive about what it actually means to follow Jesus. And I think that's a fair critique. But the core message of the sinner's prayer is is actually a really beautiful one. It's simply asking God to do for us what he is constantly offering to do for everyone else, which is to provide forgiveness, to remove our sin as far as the east is from the west. It's a beautiful promise like we just read about. But the next part is a little tricky, And it could probably be an entire sermon in and of itself. But the next step is receiving forgiveness from God. We must learn how to forgive ourselves, right? So many of us are harboring shame and guilt in very unhealthy ways. We simply can't believe that there is enough grace available for the things we've done. And so we refuse to forgive ourselves. But forgiving ourselves, it means seeing ourselves the way God sees us. Like we just sang, right? I am who you say I am. As his child who, through the power of Christ, has had our sins removed as far as the east is from the west. That's how we have to see ourselves. And this forgiveness for us is past, present, and future. I love how C.S. Lewis says it. I think that if God forgives us, we must forgive ourselves. Otherwise, it is almost like setting up ourselves as a higher tribunal than him. But as difficult as that is, choosing to forgive ourselves, I still think receiving forgiveness from God is much less complex than extending it to others, especially considering how often it's been abused. So in Matthew 18, we're going to spend the rest of our time there this morning. If you want to turn there, you can. The verses will also be on the screen behind me. You can do so on a Bible, phone, anything like that. Jesus tells a story to illustrate this point about forgiveness and about how it's complex. Matthew 18, starting in verse 21. 
Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like, now that's an important text there. Jesus tells about 30 parables. I'll talk more about that in a second throughout his lifetime. And he usually starts it like this. The kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of God is like, the father in heaven is like, these things like that. These are stories to illustrate larger points. So the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. Okay, pause there. I put it up there. That's 200,000 years of wages. Right? This, is a, this is a specific measurement, a bag of gold. Uh, your version might say talents. It's a, it's a specific measurement, right? So 10,000 bags of gold, I believe one talent was about 20 years wages. So 10,000 talents or 10,000 bags of gold is about 200,000 years of wages. This is like Jesus saying he owed him a zillion dollars, all right? This is like a ton. So as he began the settlement, a man who owed him a zillion dollars was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. This is a very common practice in this time, right? People were actually sold into debtor slavery. They were in it until they were able to pay off the debt. Sometimes that lasted generations and then they were set free. So that's what this guy's going to do. But as a servant fell on his knees before him, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. But he really can't pay back everything, right? He's just saying, I'm going to try. I'm going to do my best. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 silver coins. That is another exact measurement. It's 100 days of wages. Okay? He owed a zillion dollars. This guy owed him, you know, a few thousand. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. That is the exact same phrase that he just used with the master. The first servant used with the master. The second servant uses with the first servant. Be patient with me and I will pay it back. Now, this is actually a real offer, right? He could pay this back. The first servant couldn't pay it back. It's too much. But the second servant, this could actually work out. But the first servant refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the first servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I have had it on you? And in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Kind of an intense passage, right? Intense story from Jesus here. Now in this passage, again, Jesus is telling a story to make a larger point, something he did about 30 different times at least. Now this is not meant to be literal in the sense that God is not actually throwing people in jail who harbor unforgiveness. Right? God is not selling families into debtor slavery in order to pay back what is owed to him. But it speaks to this greater truth about how forgiveness is meant to function inside of the kingdom of God, inside of the family of God. The servant owes his master the equivalent of zillions of dollars and the master forgives his debt. But then the servant goes out, finds a fellow servant who owes him the equivalent of thousands of dollars and decides to get violent with him, choking him. And then throws him in jail, even as he begs to be able to pay it off. Now, when the master finds out about the first servant's behavior, he is angry, right? And he asks, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had on you? He says, you have been forgiven so much, and yet you can't forgive someone else so little? So the master decides to throw the first servant in jail, giving him the same punishment notice that the first servant gave the second servant, thrown in jail. This theme of being treated the same way that we treat others pops up throughout Jesus' teaching. It's a, it's a very important theme that Jesus talks about. It's like the famous golden rule. Do you remember that one? Found in Matthew seven twelve. Do to others whatever you would have them do unto you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. Jesus is saying the essence of everything in the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament, when you put it all together, 
It's basically do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Treat people well. Jesus also says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with that measure you use, it will be measured to you. And then much later, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, Peter puts it like this. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with blessing. This is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. That's 1 Peter 3, 9. So Peter was one of Jesus' closest friends and disciples who was leading a church in Jerusalem, the first church, when he wrote that passage. But I actually think that we can trace back Peter's understanding of forgiveness and blessing to this story right here, the one that Jesus just told about the master and the servant. Because remember, Peter is the one who asks the question that causes Jesus to tell this parable in the first place. Verse 21, then Peter came up to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. So let me summarize this. Peter is like, okay, Jesus, I know this new kingdom that you keep talking about. You, you mentioned forgiveness a lot. That's like a core thing. But how much are you really talking about here? Like, when do we get to stop forgiving? When do we get to just say, like, that's enough. I can't do this anymore. Like seven times? Like after, like on eight, I can be done, right? And I bet Peter was feeling pretty generous here, right? Seven times is a lot. Somebody did the same thing to you that was really painful seven times. And you were just like, yeah, no, I forgive. That'd be tough. But Jesus said, no, not seven times, 77 times. Now at face value, it looks like Jesus is using a play on words to demonstrate how we're supposed to keep forgiving forever, right? Not seven times, 77 times. And that's partially true, but there's actually more to it than that, which is really cool. I want to show you something. Jesus is actually making a reference to a passage of scripture from the Old Testament book of Genesis about a guy named Lamech. Has anybody ever heard of Lamech? A few of us kind of an obscure character. Lamech is a descendant of Cain. Most of us have heard of Cain, Cain, Cain and Abel. Cain murders his brother Abel in cold blood out of jealousy. Well, Lamech is carrying on Cain's legacy in a major way. You see, Lamech is so violent, so vindictive that he actually writes a song about all the terrible things that he's done. Here's what he says. Genesis 4, 23 through 24. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain's revenge is seven times, then Lamech's is 77 times. Isn't that a cool passage? I mean, not really. That's bad. It's a bad passage. You know what I mean. The people listening to Peter and Jesus talk that day, they would have immediately understood this reference. You see, Jesus is declaring in no uncertain terms that the kingdom of God is never going back to the way of Lamech. Lamech was all about unrelenting revenge. Jesus is all about unrelenting forgiveness. As Dr. King said, forgiveness is not an occasional act. It is a constant attitude. Not seven times, 77 times. Now, quite clearly, the way of Jesus is the way of unconditional forgiveness, right? Nothing is unforgivable and no one is beyond redemption in the kingdom of God. We're not going back to the way of Lamech. It is the way of Jesus for us moving forward. But this is where the sermon usually stops, right? And that's a problem. Because teaching the truth about unconditional forgiveness without teaching the truth about healthy boundaries found in the verses right before this is why we see forgiveness so often abused and weaponized. See, Christians are told we're required by God to unconditionally forgive, but there's no definition of what forgiveness is. There's no instruction on how to do it in a healthy, Christ-like way. So we're most often left with these trite cliches like forgive and forget. God has taken our sins as far as the east is from the west. That's what you're supposed to do to other people. Take their sins against you as far as the east is from the west. But let me tell you a secret. As a biblical scholar, not really, but I study a little bit. Forgive and forget is not a biblical concept. It's not anywhere in scripture. In fact, I want to show you that it's actually pretty close to the opposite 
of what Jesus teaches. So with the rest of our time together, we're going to talk about what forgiveness is, what it's not, and how to practice it in a healthy, Christ-like manner. So first, let's talk about what it's not. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is not forgetting. I honestly don't even understand how this is supposed to work, right? We all know that the act of forgiving someone does not erase what has happened from our memories. So when people tell us to forgive and forget, we inevitably just don't forget, right? Even if we try, we can't. It's mostly impossible. And so we either lie and say that we have forgiven or forgotten, or we just like really start to feel ashamed all the time, right? We start to believe that something is wrong with us because we keep remembering what has happened. We try to pretend like everything is fine. We try to get on with the relationship like nothing has changed, but it doesn't work. Forgiving is not forgiveness, which leads me to my next point. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. Now, these two things are often conflated, but they are incredibly distinct. They are different. I taught a whole sermon on this last year, but there are a lot of steps before reconciliation of relationship can occur. Here's the outline that I gave to folks. It starts with realization, understanding what you've done wrong, admitting it, repentance, making a change of direction is how scripture uses that, turning around, deciding to do something else to go a different way, restitution, doing everything you can to make what was wrong right, paying someone back, trying to uh, bring restitution for whatever has gone wrong. And then there is a possibility of reconciliation, not a guarantee, but a possibility. Now you cannot control if someone realizes what they've done wrong. You can't control if they change their behavior in repentance. You can't control if they seek to provide restitution. You can't control any of that. All of those things need to happen before true, healthy reconciliation of relationship can occur. Because any attempt at reconciliation without repentance and restitution is really just manipulation. You can only control yourself and your decision to either forgive or not forgive. And the truth is, many times reconciliation is impossible or reconciliation is unwise. Maybe the person who wronged you has passed away, right? And you actually can't have reconciliation with them. Maybe it's not safe or healthy for you to be around them. So reconciliation back to the way it was before is not possible. Or maybe they just haven't done the necessary work of repentance and restitution. Whatever the case may be, forgiveness is not the same thing as reconciling the relationship. And even after you forgive you may need to have strict boundaries in place. In fact, I would like to make the case that Jesus was very pro-boundaries in situations like these. We know this because of Jesus' words right before he tells the servant and master story. Matthew 18, starting in verse 15. Read along with me. If your brother or sister, not out loud, sorry, that was unclear. You just can read as the thing goes. <laughs> if your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along with you so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And if they still refuse, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So what, I'll come back to that in a second, the pagan or tax collector. What does Jesus say to do if someone sins against you, if someone wrongs you? You talk to them. If that doesn't work, you take someone else, you talk to them. If that doesn't work, you take even larger group. What are those? Boundaries. Those are boundaries. Because if someone hurts you and you confront them about how they've hurt you and they don't care, being alone with them again is not a safe place for you, right? Taking someone with you is not weakness or wickedness. It is a healthy boundary prescribed by Jesus in this text. Now, quick side note that worth explaining. Jesus says to treat the person who refuses to own up to hurting someone else as a, quote, pagan or tax collector. Now, this may seem kind of confusing if you know much about Jesus' life because he spent a lot of time hanging out with pagans and tax collectors, right? 
But both of these groups engaged a lot of times in predatory and abusive activities toward others. So some pagans, not all of them, some pagans in Jesus' day engaged in a number of abusive practices like child sacrifice and things like that while tax collectors were notorious for stealing from and exploiting other people. Now, Jesus hung out with these folks a lot, spent a lot of time with them. But it, he was always calling them toward something else. He was always calling them to leave their abusive practices behind and become a healthy member of the family. So when Jesus says, treat them like a pagan or a tax collector, it doesn't mean cutting them off and never letting them come back. But it does mean they have to stop abusing people without remorse before they're welcomed back into relationship with everyone else. And it might mean that there will always be boundaries in place with the relationships with those they have abused. Now, Tim Mackey from the Bible Project has an excellent sermon on forgiveness that was so helpful as I prepared this week. When talking about this passage, he says, if this is an unsafe situation, Does Jesus envision that you are ever alone with that person again? No. Apparently, Jesus thinks that creating safe boundaries of increasing distance between you and the offender is what we need to be doing. Some of you know firsthand the abuses of the suffer in silence and become the doormat, and I'm just going to take it for Jesus. But Jesus is not asking you to do that. I'm going to say that again because some of you really need that. Jesus is not asking you to do that. He is asking you to forgive, but he's not asking you to keep yourself in a dangerous or abusive situation. So forgiveness does not mean reconciliation. And lastly, forgiveness is not a substitute for justice. Now, next week, I'm actually going to close out this series by talking about justice, what it is, what it's not. It's a core attribute of God. So I'm not going to spend much time on it right now, but I do need to point out that forgiveness does not mean condoning bad behavior or bypassing consequences. In fact, this is usually the worst possible thing to do because ignoring the need for justice often leads to the offender hurting even more people, right? This is not only what happened in the Southern Baptist Church scandal that I mentioned earlier. This is what happened for decades in the Catholic Church. When a priest was discovered to be abusing parishioners, a lot of times the priest was forgiven but there was no justice enacted. And then the priest would be moved to a different parish where they would inevitably abuse someone else. This occurred literally thousands of times, thousands of times over decades. Forgiveness is not a substitute for justice. We can extend forgiveness and pursue justice at the same time. We can and we must do those things simultaneously. So, That's what forgiveness is not. It's not forgetting, it's not reconciliation, and it's not a substitute for justice. So what is forgiveness? Here's the definition I've put together. Forgiveness is the choice to let go of hate, resentment, and the right to revenge. Forgiveness is the choice that we make to let go of hate, resentment, and the right to revenge. And usually, y'all, it's not like a one-time thing. Forgiveness is a choice we make over and over and over again. In his excellent book, The Shack, William Young says, forgiveness is not about forgetting. Forgiveness does not create relationship. Forgiveness in no way requires that you trust the one you forgive. Forgiveness does not excuse anything. You may have to declare your forgiveness a hundred times the first day and the second day, but the third day will be less. And each day after, until one day you realize that you have forgiven completely. In the last verse of that story we read, Jesus says forgiveness begins in the heart, right? And heart in this culture was a combination of kind of your mind and will and emotions. It's this kind of mashup term for what we use as the brain and the heart. Jesus is saying that forgiveness is a choice that we make, not based on what the person who has wronged us has done to deserve forgiveness, but based on how God has forgiven us. Now listen, this is really important. The temptation that we face is to withhold forgiveness until someone has sought it in the correct way, right? We want to withhold forgiveness until someone has had the realization, has done the repentance, has tried to make the restitution. We want to withhold until that happens, but that's not what Jesus tells us to do. 
We are called to forgive as we have been forgiven by God. Doesn't mean reconciliation, doesn't mean forgetting all the things that I just said, but we are called to extend forgiveness. Why is that? Because refusing to forgive someone doesn't just hurt them, it hurts you. It hurts you. How many of you have ever held on to unforgiveness in your life? How did it feel? Did it help? Did you wake up every morning feeling better because you were withholding it? A lot of times the other person doesn't even know, right? That you're withholding forgiveness. Anne Lamott talks about how withholding forgiveness is like drinking rat poison and expecting the other person to die. Noah Gunderson, in one of my favorite songs of his, talks about how unforgiveness is like holding a sharp knife by the blade and squeezing it harder and harder and harder. These are self-inflicted wounds when we choose not to forgive. And our Father in heaven, who loves us so dearly and so deeply, does not want that for us. He does not want that for any of his children. When we hold on to hate, and resentment and revenge, no matter how justified we may feel, we are only hurting ourselves. There's this Christian ethicist named Lewis Smedes who has authored two great books on forgiveness that I highly recommend, but in one of them, he writes this, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and to discover that the prisoner was you. See, unforgiveness is a prison sentence that we place upon ourselves. Hate, resentment, and revenge are all chains that keep us forever bound to our pain and our suffering. Nelson Mandela knew all about that, right? 27 years he was unjustly incarcerated for fighting against apartheid in South Africa, but he chose forgiveness. Why? Here's what he said. As I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I would still be in prison. Why does Jesus tell us to forgive? We forgive others because God has forgiven us. And we forgive others because hate, resentment, and revenge only hurt us. They only lead to more pain. And like we've said throughout this year of healing and wholeness, God's desire for each of us is to experience fullness of life. And receiving and extending forgiveness is one of the most crucial steps on that journey toward healing and wholeness. I'm about to pray and the band is going to come back up. But I want to just say, if you are holding on to unforgiveness this morning, I want to encourage you to to use the next few minutes to just make a change to try to let some of that go. And like William Young says, it may be a hundred times the first day that you have to declare it. And maybe a hundred times again the second day, but it's gonna get better and it's gonna get easier. So I want you to ask God, as we pray and sing and all of that stuff, to maybe show you unforgiveness that you're harboring if you're not already aware of it. And then I want you to ask him to help you extend forgiveness just like he has forgiven you. Not reconcile, not sidestep justice, not any of those things that we talked about, but to extend forgiveness. I think it might be, for many of us, the most important step on our journey toward healing and wholeness. I just want to offer that to you. Um, I'm going to pray in just a second. And then some of our members of the prayer team that I mentioned earlier are going to be in the back. So if they're standing in the back looking at you, that's a prayer team member. If you'd like to go pray with someone and like just ask for help praying with someone, extending forgiveness, ask for help working through a process of reconciliation, maybe that you're in and that you're struggling with, whatever that looks like. If you'd like to take advantage of that, love for you too. If not, that's totally fine. We wanted to offer that to you this morning because I really do believe that some of us are being held back from stepping in to healing and wholeness and fullness of life because we are holding on to unforgiveness like a knife by the blade and is killing us. And I want to help us take that step and let it go this morning. That sound good? Okay, let me pray. Lord God, you are so good to us. You have forgiven us 
zillions of dollars of debt. With just one ask, with one request, you lavish unforgiveness upon us, God. I pray that we would be people of forgiveness, that we would not go back to the way of Lamech, that we would move forward in the way of Jesus in unconditional forgiveness, that we would extend that to folks. We would remember that doesn't mean forgetting, it doesn't mean reconciliation, it doesn't mean sidestepping justice, it doesn't mean any of that, God. But it means letting go of the hate and the resentment and the revenge that is hurting us, God. Help us to do that this morning and each morning. Make us more like your son, Jesus. We pray this in his name, amen.